Hello, lads, lassies, and those of unspecified gender, it's the Irishman here, and today, we're going to be talking about what would have happened if Gohan was trained by Master Roshi. One of the biggest problems you see people talking about when discussing Gohan's character is the fact that he doesn't train during peace times, most obviously during the time between the Cell Arc and Boo Arc. And sure, from an outside perspective, we can critique Gohan on this, Although, if we were in his shoes, can you really say you'd act any different? You are currently the strongest person in the universe. Your father beat Frieza and you surpassed him. So at this moment, you've surpassed the person who beat who is said to be the strongest in the universe, making you, by extension, the most powerful person in the cosmos. Sure, Cell appeared and was stronger than everybody else, but he was also claimed to be the perfect being the pinnacle of strength, and you yourself surpassed him. Stack all of that on top of the fact you don't really like fighting, and I wouldn't blame you for not wanting to train, expecting yourself to be able to beat any threat that comes to the Earth. And really, I can't blame Gohan for not wanting to train over those seven years. In hindsight, we can say it was a bad decision, but he did as well. That's why we saw him training in Super, or at least after Resurrection F. But what if he learned this lesson sooner? What if he was taught from a young age to focus on bettering oneself rather than overcoming temporary challenges? What if he was trained in the Turtle Hermit way? Well, that's what we're talking about today. So without further ado, let's get into the story of this what if. Piccolo has just used his newly formed special beam cannon to kill both Goku and Raditz. Both brothers died from a single attack, although it definitely wasn't a mutual decision. Goku decided he was going to sacrifice himself to save the Earth one last time, as he had done many times before this, in fact, even once from Piccolo, who was the one to deal the finishing blow and inadvertently actually save the planet. The Namekian warrior takes a second to think about what he just did. Not only did he get revenge for his father, but he also just saved the world. But why? Why did he team up with Goku? Why didn't he just let Raditz kill all the humans? Piccolo didn't care about them. He's the Demon King Piccolo for Kami's sake. Well, at least the reincarnate of him. But that gets him thinking as well. Is he really the demon that his father was? He enjoyed saving all of those lives, and honestly, if all the humans died off, there'd be nobody for him to rule over. But does he even want to rule the world? He should, he should want to rule over all of them with an iron fist, but that's not his way of thinking. With his mind foggy and not being able to think straight, Piccolo decides to go to the only person who should be able to think like he does the only other Namekian on the planet. Noticeably, this time he didn't decide to kidnap Gohan, meaning that Roshi is able to take the young half Saiyan back to his place. The Z warriors begin debating what they should do with him. His dad died in battle in front of him and his mother wouldn't want him training, but at the moment he's probably the best chance the Earth has against the other Saiyans. And if we're being real, against Piccolo as well. Nobody has any idea where he stands in all of this. So it'd be a shame to just let all of Gohan's potential go to the wayside. With all this in mind, Roshi opts to train the son of Goku, just like he did with Gohan's father before him. The kiddo will be moving mountains in no time, although starting off they would learn key control, since Gohan isn't exactly in peak physical condition, being a five-year-old and all. Key is a mix of your mental and physical abilities, so it should be easier for Gohan to master before doing outright physical training. We'd witness a scene closely resembling Gohan and Videl from the Boo Saga, although rather than learning how to fly, they're mostly just getting a handle on the basics. Gohan would quickly be able to learn how to fire a key blast, and after that a Kamehameha. He's a prodigy just like his father, if not even more so. But as hard as it is to believe, having a giant ray of death isn't going to win you every fight, so Gohan will need to get strong in other ways. Now, being able to enhance his physicality with Ki, Gohan would be strapped to a giant heavy turtle shell, which although impedes his movement, that's kind of the point. 
The shell is heavy and makes it hard to move. So the more you use it, the more you get used to it and the better you are without it. After only a week, Gohan would be used to the first shell, so they up it to level two, and in the same amount of time, he gets used to that as well. By the time he's on level three, Chi Chi would have found out about his training and decided to come to Kame House to see what the hell was going on. For the longest time, Krillin would have just told Chi Chi that Goku and Gohan were staying at Kame House for a while, just catching up with old friends. He didn't have the heart to tell her her husband was dead and her son was probably the best chance the world had. But when she finally gets fed up enough to decide to go give Goku an earful for keeping her son away from her for so long, she realizes she's not going to be able to do that. Roshi would tell her everything that happened, from Raditz coming to Earth and fighting Goku, nearly kidnapping Gohan, Goku and Piccolo teaming up, to then Goku and his brother both being killed. Goku didn't have to die, or at least he wouldn't have if Gohan could actually control his power. Raditz was a super powerful alien, and Gohan was somehow able to hurt him. He brought the monstrous Saiyan to his knees, and even though Raditz was able to get back up, if Gohan could harness that power, if he mastered it, he'd be unstoppable. And even though they can bring Goku back, and they very much do intend to, Gohan is probably the only thing standing between the Earth and eradication from the other Saiyans. Hearing all of this from Roshi, even though she's still hesitant, Chi Chi does decide to allow Gohan to continue training although underneath her supervision. But not only will she help to train him, she'll also train alongside him. The two can grow as mother and son, and there's no way in hell that Chi Chi is going to let Gohan fight alone. He might have the potential to surpass the other Saiyans, but he's still just a kid, so Chi Chi's gonna make sure that he has somebody in his corner. Krillin then swears on his own life to make sure Gohan isn't fighting alone against the Saiyans. He'll join in too. And then Tien says the same, Yamcha as well. Over the next year, they're going to do everything they can to get as strong as possible, and Tien would eventually decide to go train with Kami to achieve that goal. Because not only would he be undergoing the same training that Goku did years ago, but he would also be training alongside Piccolo, who is currently the strongest, if not second strongest person on the planet. And it's not like the Namekian wouldn't need a sparring partner. Tien is probably top five, if not number three right now. After the year has passed and everybody is fully prepared, two Saiyan space pawns land on the planet. Nappa and Vegeta have arrived. Now, I don't want to list off everybody's individual power levels, so I'll just put them on screen. I know there are a lot of numbers people watching right now, but I don't feel like wasting all that time, so this is the best you're gonna get. Almost immediately after exiting their space pods, Nappa turned his entire city to dust, vaporizing it instantly and killing thousands of people. This was an absolute tragedy, although it did allow for the gang to know where the Saiyans arrive, so they all rush over. Gohan would be seen repping his own Zad of Turtle Hermit Gee, although the rest of the gang is relatively unchanged, except that there are two people there that weren't in the original, Chi Chi and Master Roshi. They figure the more people there, the better their odds of success, and they were right. Nappa would plant the Cybermen and this time Yamcha doesn't die, in fact there are no casualties. The Cybermen are disposed of with relative ease. Tien would take two of them out with a single blast, whereas Piccolo would take three out with a mouth beam. Nappa realizes that these guys are the real deal and decides to not play around. He copies Piccolo's move and blasts a giant beam from his mouth. Of course, you'd expect this to do some serious damage, but through training with Kami, Piccolo's become much more powerful. Keep in mind, Piccolo didn't really train all that much in the original, and even when he did, he was doing it by himself. With no sparring partner and no special environments to train in, it's astounding that Piccolo got as far as he did in the original series. Although having Tien to train with and possibly getting some experience in the room of spirit and time, Piccolo's incredibly powerful. In fact, he'd be able to take on Nappa on his own, while the rest of the group fights off against Vegeta. For the most part, the Saiyan Prince is able to make quick work of the entirety of the Z Fighters. He's just a completely different breed than Nappa, who himself was already incredibly powerful and definitely stronger than most of the Z Fighters. There is one problem though for the Prince, this being Gohan, who not only would have gotten much stronger training under Roshi far more than he did with Piccolo, 
but he's also mastered his rage boost. Sure, Gohan is still a kid, and children aren't exactly known for their emotional control, although Roshi is an amazing teacher and has tutored the former generation. And there's no reason to say that Roshi wouldn't be able to do the same with the next one. Gohan would probably behave much like his father in the fight against Demon King Piccolo, although much more reserved. He would still value himself as a pacifist, although he's come to understand the benefits of fighting, especially when it comes to protecting those you care about. So it's definitely the same Gohan we know and love, although he accepts his role as a warrior, rage boost and all. Being able to access his full power at any time, especially given the fact his full power is much higher than it was in the original, means that Gohan's able to give Vegeta a pretty good run for his money. Things do get a little bit problematic when Vegeta sends a giant blast of energy into the sky. This wasn't to destroy anything, but rather clear the clouds. That way they had a perfect view of the moon. Vegeta would then transform into the mighty Ozaru, but Gohan does as well. This is a major problem, because even though Gohan still gets the same 10 times boost the other Saiyans do, everybody else stays at the same level, meaning heavy hitters like Piccolo and Tien now are pretty much nothing in comparison. Chi Chi would call out to her son, making sure that Gohan still remains conscious while as a great ape, and this is something that they had worked on before. This was far from Gohan's first transformation, in fact it was more like his fourth, because over the year, there had been many full moons that Gohan stumbled upon looking at. So it's only natural that at some point during his training, multiple times in fact, he'd become an Ozaru. And even though it makes sense to say that Roshi would just destroy the moon like Piccolo did in the original, or like Roshi did in the beginning of OG Dragon Ball, I don't think he would. I feel like Roshi, being the hyper-intelligent old hermit that he is, he realizes if Goku did this back in the day and Gohan can too, it only makes sense for Vegeta and Nappa to be able to do the same. So if Gohan wants any chance of fighting against their great ape forms, he's going to have to master his. It'd be incredibly difficult, but with people there to call out to him while he's rampaging, Gohan would be able to master this form, at least briefly. Enough to stay on par with the likes of Nappa and Vegeta in their own forms. But no matter how you twist it, two great apes is still far too much for anybody to handle, even if they're comparable power-wise. So Gohan is still being pressured. Or at least he was, until Gohan straight up ripped Nappa's tail clean off, transforming the hulking Saiyan back to base. Of course, Vegeta believes that if he turns his back to the young warrior even once, the same thing will happen to him. So he tries to make sure he can't be snuck up on. But that's not who he should have been worrying about. Instead of fearing the son, he should have been afraid of the father. The newly revived son Goku steps in with a Kamehameha plus Kaioken times two, to completely eviscerate Vegeta's tail. Now, both of the Saiyan invaders are brought back to their base forms, as well as being practically insignificant compared to not only Goku, but also Gohan. As the half Saiyan still has his tail, and is still Nozaru, so he is much more powerful than everybody else on the planet. Vegeta would be spared by Goku, since it's not like the Saiyan Prince can really do much of anything right now, although Nappa wasn't so lucky having been killed almost immediately by Piccolo when he transformed out of Ozaru. Through his training with Kami, Piccolo has become a better person, although he's still not above killing. He's more than willing to take somebody out if they're a threat to him or the planet. The gang would bring Vegeta to Capsule Corp, and more specifically to Bulma, the only person alive who could probably make some way to restrain somebody as powerful as the Saiyan Prince. And no, not like that, you dirty-minded miscreants, although a relationship would begin to form between the two. Nothing serious yet, but they get to know each other and take a liking to each other's personalities. It's a bit harder on Bulma's side since Vegeta is still a bit of a prick here, although Saiyans love strong-willed women, so Vegeta's all in. Although eventually the two lovebirds stop gawking at each other and Goku comes in to interrogate the Saiyan Prince. They need to know everything about whether more Saiyans are coming or if there's any other threats they should be worried about. 
And as it turns out, there actually is one enemy to pretty much everybody. His name is Frieza, and of course, the Earthlings would know about him, but pretty much everywhere else in the universe, he's regarded as a tyrant, a monster, and all around the bane to everything good in the universe, which makes Goku want to deck him in the schnoz. Although, he's also incredibly powerful, making Goku want to have a genuine fight with the guy. Not only do Saiyans love strong-willed women, they also adore a challenge, so Goku Goku's definitely down to find out where this Frieza guy is and bring it to him, although King Kai doesn't exactly recommend that. But Frieza isn't your average opponent. See, he's multiple times stronger than even Vegeta in his great ape form, and as the rumors go, he has a transformation beyond that so he's way out of Goku's league as it currently stands. But the rumors don't just go in Frieza's favor, as King Kai has been asking around and he found out there's a transformation beyond that of Ozaru, one that Goku can achieve. It's called Super Saiyan, and in the land of the living, it's regarded as a legend. Although in the land of the dead, there are multiple, Goku just needs to train with one. Goku asked why North Kaio didn't just bring this up sooner, and King Kai states that 1. Goku never asked, and 2. He didn't feel like it was relevant until now, plus he did just kind of figure it out. But if King Kai were to make a deal with King Yama and get Goku to go to the Guardian of Earth and ask Kami to bring him to the Land of the Dead for a one-time visit just to train with King Kai to get Super Saiyan, then they might have a chance. And that's exactly what happens. Goku asks if he can be brought to Yama's check-in station, that way he can go to King Kai. And Kami would do this, it's definitely within his power. Piccolo would ask if he can go as well. He doesn't like Goku, but this could be a way to bridge the relationship between the two, as well as giving Piccolo the opportunity to learn Kaioken, a technique that would massively increase his power. It's certainly more work on King Kai and Kami's parts, but they're able to pull a few strings and make this happen. Now, the Sane and Namekian duo would be training under King Kai, one trying to learn the Kaioken, and the other trying to surpass it with Super Saiyan. Gohan would remain on Earth and train underneath Kami, who would teach him many useful abilities, as well as how to use his key more effectively. Sure, the young half Saiyan could throw a couple Kamehamehas and launch a few key blasts, but he couldn't do any of the more advanced techniques. For example, Gohan never learned how to fly because Roshi never taught him. In fact, Roshi never knew himself, although Kami was able to teach Goku how to before the 23rd Tenkaichi Budokai, so it's definitely something Gohan could learn. As well as the Tenchi no Senko, or Angel's Flash of Light, as a counter to the Ma Senko, taught by Kami rather than Piccolo. After about a year, that very Namekian would return to Earth, now having mastered the Kaioken. Goku would still be in Otherworld attempting to learn and master Super Saiyan, as there's a bit of a level cap you need to reach before he can access the form. The transformation comes from a need, not a desire, so if you're trying to access the form without external circumstances pushing you to do so, then you're going to need at least a power level of 100,000. For the last year, Goku and Piccolo were training to achieve that level, and eventually they would, but Super Saiyan is still incredibly difficult to access, so Goku's working on it, but but he'll be home soon. As for what Vegeta was doing over that time, he was mostly training with Gohan. The half Saiyan's potential meant he was constantly in the lead, although there were brief glimpses where Vegeta surpassed him. And even though during those times, people were worried Vegeta was just going to straight up destroy the planet, the threat that Goku and Piccolo could come back at any time and beat the ever-loving piss out of him definitely meant he was going to stay in line. On top of that, Gohan still has a tail, and through Vegeta mentioning that he could create artificial moons, Gohan would work out the same sort of thing, creating a tiny artificial moon inside of him to generate the necessary blood's waves to transform into an Ozaru. Let's not forget that Gohan is still a genius, and if the Saiyans can create artificial moons, I'm sure eventually Gohan could learn how to do this. But it wasn't just intimidation that caused Vegeta to not lash out and destroy the world. In fact, he didn't want to. Not only did he have a more lusty motivation from Bulma, but we'd also get to see Vegeta having the same sort of dynamic with Gohan that Piccolo did in the original. He's becoming a better person just through training with a young lad. Although, it's not going to stay peaceful forever. Eventually, the Earth would have some new visitors, in the form of the Ginyu Force. Frieza would realize that Vegeta hasn't been responding to any of the messages to his scouter, and he also was last seen on the planet Earth. 
His squad was never sent to go visit that planet on missions, so either he found something incredibly valuable there, or he was murdered and brought to that planet. Of course, we know which one Frieza would most like to happen, but it's definitely the former. Either way, the legendary Ginyu Force would be sent to find out what's going on, and after arriving on Earth, they would find Vegeta, although not in the way they'd appreciate. After the five space pods all crash land on the planet, Vegeta would be the first to arrive on the scene. Using his newly found key sensing abilities, he'd be able to detect who exactly these guys are, and they're a pretty big threat. He would immediately take out Gulda with a single attack, before then fighting against Raccoon who would be decided to be first up to battle. The Ginyus aren't taking this very seriously. Although they would start to after Vegeta absolutely decimates Raccoon. It'd be no real contest. The Saiyan Prince has gotten many times stronger while training with Gohan and Raccoon is dog fodder compared to him. Ginyu would be enraged. She has no idea how Vegeta could do something like this. How he's so strong. After all, he's just a Saiyan, even if he is their prince. This then sends Vegeta into a monologue about how he is no ordinary Saiyan. He's transcended beyond royalty. He is now a legend. He is the Super Saiyan. But this time, even he knows that's bull. It is still a great way to intimidate people though. Berta and Jace would get into position to launch their ultimate attack, but Vegeta's already had his fun. So he powers up to max and then blasts the three of them away instantly. Ginyu wouldn't even get the chance to switch bodies, he would just be gone in a brilliant flash of light. But after all, these are just the henchmen. What about the main course, the final boss? Well, Freeze is still out in space, but there is one thing of note to talk about with him. Because Gohan was able to properly defend the Earth against Vegeta, the Earthling Z fighters are still alive, so there's no need to go to Namek, meaning Frieza was uninterrupted in his quest to get the Dragon Balls. It's debatable whether or not Frieza would be able to convince any Namekians who help him actually use the Dragon Balls, but I believe that he's good enough at torture and interrogation to eventually get at least one Namekian to help him. Of course, there would be rogue hero types like Nail and other warrior Namekians who would attempt to stop Frieza, but they would be easily dispatched of. Even Zarbon and Doria could take out the likes of Nail with relative ease. That might have been a bit of an exaggeration. Nail could probably take down Doria, but transform Zarbon versus the warrior Namekian might actually be a pretty fun fight. Either way, Frieza could end it with a single hand movement, but still, it'd be pretty entertaining to see the two go at it. Eventually, Frieza would have gotten all seven wish orbs, as well as a beaten and broken Namekian to help him summon Perunga. They would do just that, and even though at first they try and wish Frieza away, that doesn't work. Perunga can't force Frieza away just because of how powerful the Emperor is. It was worth a shot, and Frieza can even respect the effort. Although, it didn't work out, so Frieza would actually be given his immortality in this timeline. You might wonder why the Namekian wouldn't choose to do another fake wish, have Frieza think he's immortal because there's no real way to disprove that. Although after seeing that this guy was stronger than Perunga, there's no way he would push his luck and try and get away with that fake wish trick twice. Frieza has now truly overcome reality. He's surpassed the limits of space because he can destroy it within an instant. He's overcome time because now it doesn't really matter to him, he lives forever. Now all that's left is to conquer his own mind, and the thing that's currently troubling him is Vegeta. That Saiyan pass still walks the earth, literally, and there's no way Frieza's going to let him get away with that. So immediately after gaining his immortality, he decides to leave planet Namek in peace, and by peace, I mean pieces. The Dragon Balls are the only thing that can take away his immortality, because they are the very thing that gave it to him after all, so there's no way in hell he's going to let Namek survive. After Namek, the next planet on his hit list is none other than Earth, so he sets a direct course there. His ship is incredibly fast, so it should only take him about 10 days to get there. King Kai had been keeping tabs on the Emperor. He doesn't know that Frieza is immortal, although he does know where Frieza is and where he's going. And currently, he's about to arrive on the home of the Z Fighters. So everyone begins preparing, and Goku makes his way home, now having mastered the Super Saiyan transformation.